You know, when we look at the scriptures, we see a, a very rounded picture in education that the Lord has provided for us. And I have found myself over the years being drawn to the study of Bible characters and uh, what makes those people either pleasing or displeasing to the Heavenly Father. And I found it very practical in the fact that it helps me to understand what God expects of me in my life. Um, and so this idea of being fully rounded in the diet, the spiritual diet that God has provided in the scriptures is really important. We've seen in the scriptures the, uh, the use of doctrine and how important it is to, to believe truth and to know what the plan is of God. Uh, we're given aspects of the wonderful promises that God made and uh, has yet to fulfill. So we're kind of given what to believe. We're also given what to look forward to in the promises. But just as important as any of those is the examples of interpersonal relationships and the examples we've been given of that in the scriptures. We've got bad relationships and uh, what not to do with one another. And we also have examples of good, healthy relationships, relationships that the Heavenly Father would like us to live, uh, live and to follow. And of course, there are many aspects of our lives that we need to evaluate from time to time. Uh, and I personally think it's really important in how we interact with other people, whether they be our husbands or wives or family or friends or brethren. And we find one particular example of human interaction that was especially pleasing to God in Jonathan and David. Because in that relationship, we see examples of the principles that God uh, has set forth and appreciates when people follow. And so this is an especially moving and endearing story of the friendship between these two men. In their friendship, there are many qualities that we would do well to incorporate in our own relationships in life. These are some of the things that I picked up when I read the story. In their relationship, I saw that there was a great amount of trust between Jonathan and David. There, there were reasons why they shouldn't trust each other, but they were over, able to overcome them and express the trust to, to one another. There was great loyalty between these two men. Again, they were in a position where loyalty could have been challenged, but when it was challenged, they were able to overcome it and show a sense of devotion to one another. There were acts and words of kindness that they expressed. When one of them was suffering, there was a, a sympathy that poured out of the friend to the other. There was an understanding for the experiences that Jonathan or David uh, were having. And there was a real manifestation of filial and agape love that they expressed for one another. So you've got a very rounded picture of the elements that God wants us to incorporate in the relationships that we have with one another. One of the definitions for agape love that I've appreciated feels to me very much is that agape love seeks the eternal interest of the other person. It's the highest form of love we say all the time because someone with agape love can do loving acts without requiring that love be returned. It's a love that is not self-motivated, doesn't seek self-interest. Jonathan was a great example of giving agape love without expecting anything, anything in return. Of course, you remember filial love is the type of love that a family member has for one another. It's a love that is reciprocated. I like the way Vine's Dictionary divine, defines filial love. It says, uh, I'm sorry, that's the previous. It says that filial love uh, is defined as tender affection. The scriptural admonition regarding filio is found in Romans 12.10 from the Diaglot. It says, with brotherly kindness towards each other, be tenderly affectionate in honor referring one another. Well, in the friendship between Jonathan and David, there was this wonderful combination of filio and agape love. That's the ideal. The ideal is to have both in our lives. These two men had a tender affection for one another, like true brothers, like a brother should love his brother. And they also had the other aspect of a selfless, self-sacrificing love. So here's a great example to study so that we can apply it in our own lives. Well, the friendship between Jonathan and David was truly an amazing friendship. Of course, even though they were two men, in some ways, their relationship can even be a pattern for marriage. Because marriage really should be a friendship. Marriage should have tender affection 
It should be full of sacrificial love for your mate. It should consist of trust, loyalty, kindness, and sympathy. These are all elements found in marriage, at least in a well-balanced, healthy marriage. And if they're not, I think we have the opportunity to revitalize ourselves and be inspired by stories like this uh, that we see that what the Lord can do with two consecrated hearts. So, of course, most of you aren't married, but if and when you do, remember the lessons of this relationship and bring them into your own marriage relationship, and your marriage will certainly prosper. As we explore this friendship between these two men, we see that the circumstances of life tested their friendship beyond what I believe most friendships could have endured. But the reason their friendship endured was because they never allowed outside pressures to drive them apart. There was a tremendous amount of pressure that these two man, men had that would normally have divided them, but they were able to overcome that. Even when the pressure was from Saul, Jonathan's own father, the powerful king of Israel, Jonathan would not betray David. In fact, Jonathan went out of his way looking for a way to bless and help David avoid the evil that his own father wanted to do to him. You know, Jonathan and David, or Jonathan sometimes walked a, a fine line of balancing his loyalties because it's clear that, oh, here, I think I'm behind. There we go. Jonathan walked a fine line of balancing his loyalties because it's clear that Jonathan loved his own father dearly, but he was also able to see that Saul's hatred for David was wrong, that it was based on jealousy. And because of seeing that, having the integrity to see that, Jonathan would not allow his love for David to be compromised. And so I see in this, there's a lot we can learn from this friendship. We can learn what it means to be brethren and even how we can be better husbands and wives and friends by looking at this relationship. As we look at their lives, we're going to explore an insight that Brother Russell gave us about this relationship and see that the Lord may have intended their relationship to be a picture of the spiritual relationship between the ancient worthies and the church class. This is what Brother Russell says on reprint 1908. He says, the friendship of Jonathan and David seems to be suggest suggestive of that beautiful accord which shall exist between the glorified church and the earthly princes who shall be next to them in the kingdom of God. There will not be a note of discord or rivalry or jealousy between them, for each will be delighted to fill his honored place in the wonderful plan of God and will love the other as his own soul. So in our study of these two men, we're going to examine how David represents a church class, while Jonathan represents the ancient worthies. Now, this might be an odd thing to think about, but in spite of the fact that we've lived in different ages, that none of us have ever met an ancient worthy, we still feel a special kinship to them, don't we? As part of this picture of kinship and closeness we feel with those who have gone before us, we're going to read in 1 Samuel the um, about three covenants that Jonathan and David made between themselves and how these three covenants detail the relationship between the ancient worthies and the heritage of faithfulness and loyalty and service that they have passed on to us in this age. And so in many ways, the ancient worthies are the spiritual forerunners of the church class. The ancient worthies fought their spiritual battles long before us, like Jonathan fought his before David. And you might say that the ancient worthies paved the road of sacrifice, which others would someday follow. Well, let's begin by looking at the life of Jonathan. Jonathan was the oldest son of King Saul. We're introduced to him in 1 Samuel 13, 2, where we're told that he led a force of a thousand men against the Philistines. He is believed to have been about 30 years old at this point in his life. And of course, being the oldest son of King Saul, he was the apparent heir to the throne of Israel. Jonathan was a natural leader who had a profound respect from his men. That tells you something. When the soldiers are deeply loyal to their leader, it tells you something right about the leader. Jonathan had great faith in the Lord. 
and that faith gave him courage in battle. He understood that true courage comes in knowing that there's a higher power supporting you. Jonathan knew that success on the battlefield came when he obeyed and trusted the Lord. If he did that, then the Lord would support him in battle. And I think those lessons certainly carry over in our own lives, don't they? Uh, you can have courage in your life, no matter what the situation, if you believe that God is behind you, that God is overruling every experience in your life. And if you do believe that, then it's not you fighting that battle by yourself. The Lord is at your side. And that's one of the lessons we see from Jonathan in the many battles he was in. You know, after the death of Saul and Jonathan, David wrote the eulogy about them. It's found in 2 Samuel, the first chapter, uh, verses 17 through 27. I'm going to read, read verse 23. This is what David wrote about Saul and Jonathan. He said, Saul and Jonathan, delightfully loving in their lives, even in their death were not divided. Beyond eagles were they swift, beyond lions were they strong. Jonathan seems to have had a wonderful ability to give his love to others. It says he was delightfully loving with his father and his father with him. You know, when we look at Saul, we usually look at his unfaithfulness and his bitter jealousy of David. But apparently Saul was a good father to Jonathan, and he developed this close relationship with his oldest son. And Jonathan honored and respected his father his whole life in spite of what he did wrong. One of the marvelous memories that we have of Jonathan is that he didn't cut off his relationship with his father when Saul became proud. He didn't stop loving his father when Saul sinned. You know, even when his father raged with anger over Jonathan's defense of David and even threw a spear at Jonathan, Jonathan remained loyal to Saul. I don't think many men would have done that. But Jonathan was able to separate the sin from the sinner and continue loving the sinner while hating the sin that his father was committing. Now, brethren, in your own life, think about some of the relationships that you have had for a moment. And think about Jonathan's example of respect and devotion to Saul. When someone you've had a relationship with does something that hurts you or, or offends you or is just plain wrong, how do you react? Well, I know how I often react. But if we can apply Jonathan's example of not condoning the sin, but doing all that we can to bless the sinner, we will see our relationship improve dramatically. After all, you know, if you, if you separate and you never see your brother or your friend or ever talk to them or have any interaction, just kind of separate yourself from them. How can you possibly help them or bless them? But Jonathan was a blessing to his father his whole life, in spite of the sins of his father. And it's my opinion that the Lord was thoroughly pleased with the attitude of Jonathan, and he would be pleased if we each had that same attitude. So we have a, a man with a good heart, still being able to love in spite of the sins of his father. And even though Saul had sinned and done wrong, Jonathan stuck with him in every battle. And because of that, they were killed together in the same sequence of events in the battle, along with Jonathan's two younger brothers. And so David says that even in death, they were not divided. Did this man have a loyal heart? My goodness, you bet he did. David goes on and he says in verse 26, he says, I am distressed for thee, my brother, Jonathan. Delightful to me exceedingly. Wonderful was thy love to me, passing the love of women. Yes, Jonathan was David's spiritual brother, and he brought delight to David's heart. Jonathan gave his love freely, and because of that, he must have been a, a very easy person to love. Certainly was a person who expressed his love easily. And I believe that he would have been a very good king of Israel had God chosen him. Looking at the beginning of their friendship, it appears that Jonathan first met David just after David slew Goliath. Let's go back and read 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 4. It says, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul, 
And Saul took him that day and would not and would let him go no more to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and gave it to David, and his garments, even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. I love that statement there that it says that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. There we see the uniting of filio and agape love. Jonathan saw a brother in David. He saw a man with the same heart devotion to the Lord. You know, in the past, Jonathan had been a, a brave soldier himself against the Philistines, but this time he stood quietly as Goliath taunted Israel. For some reason, he couldn't muster the same strength against this one man, Goliath, as he had earlier against an entire army of the Philistines. Goliath must have been very intimidating. With the rest of Israel's army, Jonathan just stood there listening as Goliath taunted them for 40 days. Just listen to some of the words that Goliath said to Israel. He said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Saul and Jonathan were afraid of Goliath. But when Jonathan heard the words of David, and saw him go out alone towards a giant and then strike him dead with his sling, Jonathan knew that this was a very special young man with special, strong faith. What caused Jonathan to fear and remain quiet made David's heart burn within him and fearlessly go out alone into the field against the giant to defend the Lord's name and to defend his people. That's what got Jonathan about David. Now it appears that Jonathan was at least 30 years older than David. So at this time of this experience, most commentators feel that Jonathan was probably about 50 and David was only about 20 years old. And for Jonathan, it was a thrill to see a, a younger man with such faith. David was not intimidated one bit by Goliath. And Jonathan loved that. Jonathan was not jealous of it. He didn't feel insulted that David would do something that he was afraid to do. And looking at what may have given David this amount of courage, we can only conclude that it must have been born out of previous experiences. You know, before fighting Goliath, uh, David had told Saul that he had slain a lion and a bear in defense of his father's sheep. And he reasoned in his mind that, you know, if the Lord could help me and deliver me from those wild beasts, and he certainly could deliver me from Goliath. And so in that, we see a progression in David's faith. He first battled a lion, and then a bear, and then an awesome giant who had intimidated the entire army of Israel. And I think in that progression, we see a picture of how faith can grow in us. No one we're young in the faith, when we first come into the truth, when we first become Christian, we begin to see just small overrulings in our lives. As time goes on, we begin to see the reality that God really is in control of our lives and that nothing can happen to us that is not for our good. After seeing how God helps us slay our, our smaller lions and smaller bears in our lives, we come in time and through our experiences to trust that the Lord will do that based on these previous experiences when we get to the bigger ones. As David learned to trust God, we can all learn in our own experiences that when we face our own personal Goliaths, no matter what it might be, something at school, something at our work, uh, something in a relationship, but when we face our Goliaths, God can be with us and we can be sure of that because of the previous experiences that we've had in our lives. So don't ever minimize your trials. Don't ever look at them and say, this is awful, because it's really our trials that, that build our strength for future combat. No, it was God who guided the stone to the forehead of Goliath. But you know something? David had to go out there first. David had to get his sling. David had to sling the rock. There's two parts of faith shown there. Our believing, which is our acting on what we believe, 
and then God following through and directing the issue. Had David not had the faith to do his part, then God would never have been in a position to do his own. Jonathan's faith seems to have faltered in this experience somewhat when it came to Goliath, but David's didn't. He didn't waver. Later, we're going to see that Jonathan was the one who had to encourage the faith of David. And I think that's what part of our fellowship is all about. You know, think of the, the brethren in your minds who are the strongest, who you think they never have a trial, <laughs> never are tested in their faith. But remember that there is no one like that on this earth. Even our Lord needed to be encouraged and strengthened. And I think that's what our fellowship is all about, that we can gain strength and courage from one another. And I think that's one of the main reasons the Lord encouraged us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together for the very purpose of gaining strength and courage for one another. You know, Jonathan and David were very similar in character. They were both humble men. They were honest, they had great courage, and of course, they had faith in God. And when you have those types of things in common, there is a natural bond that forms. The reason you feel such a bond to brethren is because you know that they are going through the same Christian experiences as you are. And so it's wise to seek out brethren so you have something in common, something to share, something that you can use to bolster one another up. On reprint 3232, Brother Russell says that those who would be the best friends need a third object in which both are interested, and that like the radius of a circle, the nearer they come to the center, the nearer they approach one another. Isn't that a marvelous concept? That illustration describes Jonathan and David to a T, and I think it should describe our relationship and friendships with one another. The center is Christ, and the nearer we each come to Christ, the nearer we come together to one another. We read in 1 Samuel 18, 3 and 4, that Jonathan and David made a covenant with one another. And it was Jonathan who prompted this. Remember, to seal the covenant, we're told that Jonathan took off his robe, he took off his armor, his sword, his girdle, and of course his famous bow, and he gave them to David. Uh, Jonathan was... Uh, famous throughout Israel for his ability with the bow and arrow. But when he gave they, these things, we wonder, why did he do that? Of what significance were these items to Jonathan? Well, you know, obviously, as a soldier, they probably were the most temporal, important temporal things in his life. He lived by these things. To Jonathan, they represented the honor and power of Israel. They represented his ability to defend that which was right, to give them to David showed that he considered David an equal, one who deserved to represent Israel, one who deserved to fight for the right. In fact, it was a admission that David was a greater warrior than himself. You know, it's a remarkable act here when you think of the timing in their lives, because at this point, Jonathan was the prince of Israel, and David was a shepherd boy. He was unknown to anyone, and yet it shows such humility on Jonathan's part. Well, you know, when you look at the whole story, you see that David now had two sets of armor. In 1 Samuel 17, 54, we're told that after he killed Goliath, he took Goliath's armor and put it in his tent. Of course, it doesn't tell us why, but I think it's reasonable that David wanted a token of remembrance of that great victory of faith and of God's deliverance. I think there's something also symbolic as we were saying that this armor represents the power of his nation. And so he was in essence showing that he had conquered the Philistines here. Well, now David receives Jonathan's armor. And this too became a remembrance for David of another victory, a victory where David won the friendship in the heart of Jonathan and he gained this lifelong devoted friend in Jonathan. And so the giving of the armor became a token that they had made this covenant between themselves. But in order to understand exactly what the covenant was between Jonathan and David, we need to skip to a future time in their lives because later David makes a comment and refers back to this first covenant. It's found in 1 Samuel 20, verse 8. David was despondent over Saul's desire to kill him. And he speaks to Jonathan. And this is what he says. 
He says, Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. Notice first that David reveals that it was Jonathan's idea to make a covenant. Rotherham puts it this way. He says, Into a covenant of Yahweh hast thou brought thy servant with thee. It was a covenant, in essence, between Jonathan and David on the one part and God on the other part. And the covenant was that they would help each other become always faithful to God. Jonathan knew that faith needed to be supported. He had just experienced the strengthening of his faith by David. He was now able to see the importance of a brotherhood of faith. What a support they became for one another. What a picture of brotherhood they provide for anyone who wants to be faithful to the Lord. A brotherhood of faithfulness. We need that bond together. We need this covenant together that we promise to help each other be faithful to God. And so the lesson here is that none of us can walk this Christian life alone. It's too hard. We need the love and support of one another because we're fighting the same battle. We need to compare notes. We've made a covenant, those who have consecrated, to sacrifice their life to the Lord. So like Jonathan and David, we are on the same side and we need to urge each other on. We need to support one another in our weaknesses. We need to remind one another of what is the right way to serve and to walk in the narrow way. That was the first covenant. It was a covenant of brotherhood. Well, Jonathan gave David his armor as a token of that covenant. Now, I just want to digress a little bit. There's another possibility regarding this first covenant uh, in connection with the clothing and armor that Jonathan gave to David. It gives a very specific application to this first covenant. There are a number of biblical instances when the transfer of clothing was significant. For example, in Numbers, the 20th chapter, Aaron, the high priest, was not allowed to enter the promised land as a punishment for his rebellion at the waters of Meribah. And God told Moses to strip Aaron of his clothing and put them on his son, Eliezer. The word strip in that passage is the same word used when Jonathan stripped himself of his robe and gave it to David. It shows a transfer of office from, in this case, an unacceptable man to the new one chosen by the Lord. Another example of the symbolic use of clothing is found in 1 Kings, the 11th chapter. Uh, there we see the prophet Ahijah tear his clothing into 12 pieces. He then gives 10 pieces to Jeroboam to indicate that the kingdom of Solomon would be subsequently divided into 10 and 2 tribes, and that Jeroboam would take control of the 10 tribes. The clothing then was a symbol of the nation, while the tearing was a symbol of how the nation would be torn apart after the death of Solomon. So there's two examples. A third example of the significance of clothing, remember, was when Elijah cast his mantle on Elisha as a signal of the transfer of the prophetic office from one prophet to another. So there's three biblical examples of clothing used and what it symbolizes. But there's another interesting one. This is a non-biblical uh, example of clothing being significant. In 1929, French archaeologists found a huge cache of clay tablets in an ancient seaport named Ugarit. These tablets date back to the 14th and 13th centuries BC, a short time before the time of our story. Ugarit is in present-day Syria. One particular tablet that's of interest to us as we examine the story of Jonathan and David, uh, the tablet tells of a divorce between a 13th century king and his wife. And one of the questions that was dealt with in the separation was, what would be done with their son who would have him? The queen would be allowed to return to her own country, but the son was given a choice. And the key passage of interest says the following. It says uh, this name, Yutisharuma is prince in Ugarit. If Yutisharuma says, I will go with my mother, let him place his garment on the throne and let him go. And Isramru, king of Ugarit, shall establish another of his sons in Ugarit 
his prince. Did you get your, catch the point there? By placing his garment on the throne, the prince was indicating his decision to give up the claim to that throne. If Jonathan was following this custom, then he was giving up his claim to the throne of Israel in favor of God's anointed David. Now, if that was the case, then this first covenant between them was their devotion to make the transfer of power from Saul to David become a reality. Now, either way we look at the first covenant, we see an agreement between Jonathan and David to do the Lord's will, no matter how they were personally affected by it. It was, remember, a brotherhood of faith. And doing God's will was of the utmost importance, and they understood that between themselves. Now, when we look at this covenant, of course, the natural question is, is there any antitypical significance in all of this? And we can't say for sure, but if the Lord intended the passing of the armor from Jonathan to David to be symbolic of something greater, it certainly is not difficult to see what it could represent. Of course, we know about the Christian armor. Paul writes about it in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Peace, faith, hope, and the word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Now, the fact that Jonathan was older and he was a warrior in Israel much longer than before David was shows, we believe, that the ancient worthies were in spiritual battles long before the church even came into existence. Now, Paul reflects on their influences in our lives when he talks about the ancient worthies. And he says in Hebrews 12, Wherefore, seeing that we are encompassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And so we see these great men and women of ancient times being our forerunners. They are a cloud of witnesses that help us run our race. You know, I have found many practical lessons in studying the lives of the ancient worthies. How many times have we examined their armor of faith and marveled that someone like Abraham, who waited for a son for so long, could be so willing to give him up in sacrifice to God? Is that faith? My goodness. I don't know if I could do that. How many times have we looked at the strength of Daniel, be inspired by his moral purity in an impure society, to be able to pray in the window and not to be ashamed of his God, to have the desire to see Israel blessed, to want to understand the prophecies that he was given so much that he lamented and cried over Israel. This was a great man of faith who the Lord gave some wonderful prophecies to because of that faith. How many of us have been inspired by the story of Job when he had such terrible things happen in his life to lose his family, to be so sick, and to have friends who said he'd done something against the Lord just uh, and his wife saying, you know, curse God and die. And yet he never did. He had faith in God. He didn't necessarily understand why these things were happening, but he knew that he could not deny his God. What an example of passing his armor of faith on to us. Other brave men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were willing to go into a furnace of fire before they would deny the Lord. You know, brethren, prophetically, we sometimes talk about what might be the future for the church class. And one possibility is that there might be some persecution coming. If and when that ever happens, we have examples of how to deal with that, that the Lord is stronger than anyone who would persecute us. These men and women have great, left a great legacy of faith for us just to copy. The Lord did not leave us without the tools to be faithful. And of course, Moses was such a great example of having the authority of the word of God. He wielded it in a way like a weapon because truth cut through errors. And so we have a very balanced example of people who have gone before. You know, in so many ways, their lives were mirror images of the spiritual struggles that you and I face as new creatures. And so every time we study them, 
Every time we gain inspiration from them, we are antitypically receiving the armor that David was given by his friend Jonathan. In 1 Samuel, the 20th chapter, we have the making of a second covenant between Jonathan and David. That's an extraordinarily moving story. I wish we had time to read the whole chapter. I encourage you to do that. Uh, let's just read a few sections and try to get the feel of what was happening. We know that Saul had become extremely jealous of David's popularity. In verse 1, hiding from the wrath of Saul, Jonathan flees to David. And this is what he says to David, uh, to Jonathan. David said, what have I done? What is mine iniquity and what is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? And then Jonathan, like a good friend, tries to reassure him. And he says that his relationship with his father is very strong. And he doesn't think that Saul would ever do anything without telling him first. And David responds by saying, you know, your father knows how close that you and I are. And in fact, he would not tell you if he intended to do me harm, because he wouldn't want to grieve you with that news. And then David laments in verse 3, and he says, As surely as the Lord liveth, there is but a step between me and death. So David was very despondent here. And then we see the sympathetic, and we see the tender answer that Jonathan gives his friend in verse 4. He says, Whatever your soul desires, I will even do it for you. What a friend. The son of the man who wanted to kill him, who was causing this grief to David, would give such comforting, assuring, reassuring words to David. Well, you know, in the story, David wanted to find out for sure whether Saul had planned to kill him. And so he devised a test. He told Jonathan that he would not eat at Saul's table for the next three days. And if Saul asked Jonathan uh, what had happened, Jonathan should just say, well, David had to go to Bethlehem for a yearly celebration with his family. And the test came in and seeing how Saul would react to David's absence. If Saul was not bothered by David's absence, then it would be a sign that David was not in danger. But if Saul became angry, then Jonathan would know that David's life truly was in danger. And so Jonathan agreed to the test because he became angry and uh, he threw a spear, we're told, at Jonathan himself. And so Jonathan returned to David and he warned, warned him to flee. And in their discussion, that's where we see the second covenant being made. It's found in 1 Samuel 20, verses 14 through 17. This is Jonathan speaking to David. He says, And thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. What's interesting that Jonathan should say these very things here at this point when David was fearful of Saul and depressed. Probably the furthest thing from David's mind was becoming king of Israel. He just wanted to survive. But here, Jonathan was showing David that this experience would pass. And he showed that he believed it because he spoke of the time that David would become king. And in fact, he asked David to make a covenant that when he became king, he would remember Jonathan in his house and bless his family. You know, it's, it's an extremely unusual request. Two men who under any other circumstances might have been rivals to the throne of Israel are here making a covenant that the young newcomer would bless the seed of the current heir apparent. You know, it was customary back in those days that when a king came to the throne who was not of the same lineage as the previous king, the entire family of the previous king would often be killed. Now, as cruel as that might sound, there was a practical reason for that. And, of course, the reason was to prevent any children of the previous king from creating a rebellion. My goodness, what, what a different reaction we see in Jonathan. When the, when the Lord's influence abounds, look at the difference it could make. 
rather than being rivals, Jonathan was asking for the blessing of David. Isn't that awesome? I just love that. David, David never hesitated to accept this covenant of blessing the house of Jonathan because he so deeply appreciated the love and devotion of his dear friend. He saw that Jonathan believed in God's choice for the next king of Israel, and it wasn't him, it was David. Antitypically, this corresponds to God's plan of having the younger bless the older. Remember in Psalms 45, it talks about this when it says, Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayst make princes in all the earth. Just as the older Jonathan sought the blessing of the younger David, so the ancient worthies are going to seek the blessing of the church. It's a spiritual role reversal as shown in the Psalms text. The fathers becoming the children, and in turn being blessed by me being made princes in all the earth. So you see the church will have the predominant role, just as David was to have the predominant role in Israel. After the death of Jonathan, David act actively sought out any family members that had been left to Jonathan. In 2 Samuel 4.4, 4, we're told that Jonathan had a son by the name of Mephibosheth. And David was faithful to his covenant with Jonathan. Now think about that. Jonathan was dead. There was no one who was going to see if he kept his word. But here is the loyalty of David even to a dead friend. And so once David found Mephibosheth, we're told that he brought him into his palace and he took care of him for the rest of his life. And he treated Mephibosheth as if he was his own son. You know, a simple lesson we see from David here is that when a friend says he's going to do something for his friend, he does it. He's good to his word. And so it's a very simple lesson, a very fundamental lesson, but we need to be reminded of these things, that we need to be true to our words. It's an indication of our love and respect for the one that we give our word to. Jonathan was, David was faithful to Jonathan even after Jonathan's death. I think that says so much about the character of David. Brother Russell comments on the second covenant in reprint 1908. He says, though the gospel church will receive the first place of favor offered in the Abrahamic covenant, and the ancient worthies will find themselves next in honor, they will rejoice to have it so, because divine wisdom and love have planned it. As David remembered his covenant with Jonathan not to cut off his kindness from the house of Jonathan, so the glorified church will remember its covenant to bless the ancient worthies first, and then all the families of the earth will be under their jurisdiction. Their loving ministry shall be held in everlasting remembrance. Isn't that neat? Someday, when the ancient worthies are brought back from the dead, the church will feel honored to bless those who have been such an inspiration to them. I can't wait to see Joseph brought back in the res resurrection. I can't wait to do something good for him because of the inspiration he's given me in my life. There's so many like that. Jonathan was the natural heir to the throne of Israel. But because of the unfaithfulness of his father, that honor was given to David. Jonathan never resented that because he saw the rightness of God's decision and he saw the goodness of David. What a character lesson Jonathan has left for us. No jealousy, no desire to put David's honor down so that he could be elevated. I think that says so much about what the Lord is looking for in us, a lack of jealousy and a desire to lift up our brethren. There's a French proverb that says, there is something in the misfortunes of our best friends that is not wholly displeasing to our secret hearts. Think about that. I think there's truth in that. In our fallen human natures, there may be times when we might fall into that. When in our secret hearts, we're glad when someone is put down. But brethren, in Jonathan, there was never the slightest hint of it. He rejoiced that his friend was being elevated by God. That's a living example of what Paul meant when he said, in honor, preferring one another. He really meant it. He didn't just say it. 
And that's what God is looking for, the reality of our commitment, not just our words. Have any of you ever felt the slightest jealousy for when some of your brethren or friends or family members are praised? Or when something good happens to them and you find your reaction might be, oh, why can't that ever happen to me? <laughs> well, I've experienced that and I think probably many of you have too. If that ever happens again, remember the legacy of unselfish love that Jonathan left for us. David received the throne of Israel instead of Jonathan, and it is thrilling to see how Jonathan was truly glad for David. What an example. Only from God can this fruitage be born this way. When we talk about the antitypical application of the ancient worthies playing a secondary role to the church, as Jonathan did to David, we think of Hebrews 11, 39-40. It says, and these all having attained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. There's a picture of Jonathan being blessed by David. If Jonathan pictured the ancient worthies, then it would seem logical that his son, Mephibosheth, may be a picture of the nation of Israel. You know, Mephibosheth, was only five years old when Jonathan died. And I think his being only five years old at Jonathan's death shows Israel's spiritual immaturity. And it shows really the limited influence that the ancient worthies had on Israel. Israel was too immature to have the ancient worthies bear the fruitage that could have been born had they been more mature. When the news of the death of Saul and Jonathan was uh, made known publicly, we read that his nurse fell while she was carrying him. And in her haste in running away, unfortunately, Mephibosheth was crippled in both feet. Now, this nurse was probably thinking of the same thing we mentioned earlier, that when a new king comes to the throne who's not of the lineage of the previous king, then the children of the previous king are all killed. So she probably was doing it out of good intention. But the fact that she crippled the young boy, we believe, represents the fact that the uh, false teachers of Israel, like the scribes and Pharisees, caused spiritual lameness in Israel. That their caretaking of Israel was really an unfaithful caretaking, and they caused a spiritual um, being crippled in the feet that Mephibosheth had. Now, the name Mephibosheth means one who despise, uh, disperses shame. And I think that is a fitting name for Israel, at least Israel in the past, in general, not, not those faithful ones. But in general, Israel has been immature and it has had spiritual lameness. And so the nation of Israel brought shame, it dispersed shame on itself. But in 2 Samuel 9, 7, this is what David says to Mephibosheth. I think this is neat. He says to him, fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore thee all the land that saw thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now I think David's attitude towards the son of Jonathan was exactly what the church's attitude towards the nation of Israel should be. You know, in this light, we often quote Romans 11:28 that says, As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for their father's sakes. It's even the same phraseology that David used. In his dealings with Mephibosheth, David restored all the land that his grandfather Saul had possessed. He even provided servants to till and harvest the land for the benefit of Mephibosheth. And then, and that we believe, is a picture of Israel's restoration to the promised land, of course, much of which they still have yet to receive. Now the last time that Jonathan and David saw each other is given in 1 Samuel 23, verses 16 through 18. And it's here that the third covenant is made between them. It reads, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul my father knoweth, 
And they too made a covenant before the Lord. And David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. The brethren here, again, is the filial and agape love of Jonathan shown to David. He encouraged David. He pointed him to the promise of God that he was the anointed king and that that was going to happen. And he assured him that Saul did not have the power to kill him. The third covenant, we believe, was that once David became king, that Jonathan would be next in line under him. But you know something? This is one covenant that David was not able to keep because Jonathan was killed before David was crowned. But certainly he would have made Jonathan second in command had the Lord not permitted Jonathan's death. And you know something? I, I think this is something yet to be fulfilled. I think in a very literal way, Jonathan and David will be right next to each other in the kingdom arrangement. And so David may yet have the opportunity of fulfilling his covenant with Jonathan. It just strikes me that God would allow this and make it happen because I think God had such a deep appreciation for these covenants that they were making with each other. There was no selfishness in here. This was for the blessing of others. In this interchange between Jonathan and David, we see some underlying principles um, that should be part of our relationships and our friendships together. There was a genuine sensitivity in Jonathan. He knew how David was feeling, and he made the effort to encourage him with the promises of God. He defended David. He encouraged him. He assured him that the enemy could not overcome him. Rather than that same sensitivity to what's bothering someone without them even saying a word is something that we need to foster and grow in ourselves. We need to have the ability to encourage one another when we're discouraged. We need to have the ability to stand up for somebody when someone is being abused physically or most likely verbally. When one of our brethren is attacked, we need to be willing to stand for them. It's the tools of God's promises that we can use to encourage one another that will make us part of the antitypical reign of David if we are faithful in using them. And we'll have the privilege of helping the world get rid of all its enemies, just as Jonathan and David were trying to do for Israel. When we see things in the larger context of God's plan, I think we can take courage and rejoice even during difficult experiences. We can feel the joy of belonging when we see that there are brethren who care about us and are willing to sacrifice for us. So make that a priority in your life. Care for one another. Sacrifice for one another. Give to one another. Serve one another. Be sensitive to one another. That's what family is all about. And you know something? A fundamental thing in God's plan is that he is building a family that has these characteristics for one another. In verse 23, Jonathan reaffirms his conviction to David. He says, As touching the matter which thou and I have spoken of, behold, the Lord be between me and thee forever. Isn't that a perfect summary of what we need to have in common? That's our common bond. The Lord is between you and me. I would never have known any of you had it not been for the Lord. And because of that, our bonds should be even stronger. He will be there forever. So this life that we're living now is only the beginning of where God is taking us into eternity. So let's build our friendships and our relationships on this basis of strength, of faith and conviction to God, because that common bond will unite us for all eternity. In the story of Jonathan and David, we see a beautiful oneness. We see a harmony and a unity of spirit that we would do well to copy. And so I challenge each of you as I challenge myself to think of yourself as a Jonathan and see where you can apply yourself and your loyalty to the brethren. These men were always there for each other. They supported and encouraged each other, and they pointed each other to God and his promises. They didn't look for faults in one another. You know, Jonathan was like an older brother to David for the brother who felt no sibling rivalry, who was just as happy when David was blessed, even if it cost him something. Can you picture the time when the world is going to be full of that type of spirit, when every person will have a bond of unity like that? Only God can do that. Only God can melt the hearts of man 
and create that type of spirit. But here in these two men, we have a microcosm of what God is going to do in the kingdom. Brethren, we've tasted of it on this side of the veil in some small way, but how sweet it's going to be when every heart is full of trust and loyalty and kindness and sympathy and understanding and both types of love. And so I can't wait for that to be widespread, but the, it begins right here. It begins in you and me, overcoming the natural propensities of the flesh to be uh, selfish and self-centered, to open up our hearts to the bond of fellowship and faith that we have in Christ.